And good afternoon. Welcome all again to another session from the Wealth Mosaic, um, Wealth Tech Talks. Uh, today, I'm in conversation with Luke Haldeman, who's CEO of OnBlue. Um, we're going to talk to Luke about various aspects of his business, solution offering, role in the wealth space, and some aspects about where he thinks the sector is and where it's going to go. So, Luke, um, thank you for joining us. Nice to have you here with us today. Pleasure to be here. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Um, so we will speak for maybe 45 minutes in this interview, um, trying to get into some depth about where Unblue is in the market and maybe some of the aspects that, that it has coming to market. Um, but first of all, Luke, if you could give us an introduction to yourself and your, your role at Unblue. All right. I have studied computer science here in Switzerland, have a master's degree in computer science and have started uh, the company a few years ago already. So um, Unblue is a privately held company headquartered in Basel. We have uh, a little more than 50 employees uh, here in Switzerland, in Bulgaria, Germany, UK, the US. Um, and we have a, a little more than 150 banks and insurance companies uh, currently as our customers who are using Onblue's conversational platform for the seamless and the compliant, secure conversation with customers. A little more to that a little later. Perfect. No, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, what can you tell us about the background to the firm? So you were one of the founders and what were the what were the kind of market conditions or the drivers that led to the creation of Unblue and its solution offering back at the start? Right. So we've started uh, Unblue in 2008. So it was right in the year of uh, the financial crisis uh, situation. And um, we were uh, exploring the possibilities to get people online together so pretty much to fulfill the promise uh, that uh, Tim Berners-Lee the inventor of the web um, has uh, given out with the web to really bring together people and have uh, uh, people collaborate uh, with each other. Um, in the beginning, we had we had some first implementations um, with companies like SAP, HP, uh, but also then we spotted that uh, early on that in the financial services space, um, there is quite a big opportunity uh, to move forward. We started with co-browsing, a core technology where we have also uh, two patents um, and have then developed into further functionality. So the firm um, moved into financial services rather than started in financial services, that's correct? Yes, yes, that's correct. So we explored different uh, industries and we have focused very early on on financial services because we were seeing that uh, the opportunities in financial services and the need that uh, was just starting to grow uh, over, over 10 years ago in that space was huge and it's, it's growing further. Um, and you're obviously a Swiss headquartered business, but now with international clients. So when yeah. you started, was it Swiss focused or was it also broader than that at the time? Yeah, so we did start in Switzerland, uh, but from the outset, we have developed a product that was aimed at a global presence. Uh, so um, we really built up the product as a uh, pure play product and not as a framework or anything that then needs to be um, uh, built out at the customer, but really an off the shelf product and today a platform that is used um, with one code stream for all of our customers. And can you tell us anything about major milestones, significant developments? Obviously, you moved into financial services, you're international. You've told us a little bit about um, the broad framework of the platform. What, what major events could you point to in the evolution of the firm that would be significant? Right. So um, I would have to name uh, in... in 2012, uh, we have completed our first product uh, offering and um, granted our patents, got their patent, uh, patents granted in, in 2013. Mm -hmm. In uh, 2014, we had our first big commercial uh, success uh, with some large customers um, where we really uh, were able to prove that our product meets quite a strong uh, customer demand. And uh, then we expanded in, in 2015 uh, into uh, Germany um, and Eastern Europe, um, but also had a reach out into UK and to the US very early. Um, and in 2016, four years ago, we were building out a whole set of features uh, with a large uh, development team already at that time, which was 
texting, video and audio chat. So that's live chat, but also messaging. Um, and then we have also started partnering with core banking vendors like Avalog, Temenos, and with Backbase, Prelogix, and so on with Finantix. Um, and we are, um, uh, since then, we have built out from a suite into a platform and we have now today what i'm proud to say which is, it's the gold standard for conversational banking um you mentioned some vendors there that we're very familiar with and our focus on sort of technology in the wealth management arena um you're obviously swiss so it would probably be too easy to say that you started in wealth management or private banking immediately but can you tell us a little bit about um you work in financial services but specifically in wealth management private banking what your client base looks like Right. Um, so client base is about uh, 70 to 80 percent banks and uh, there of a good portion is uh, private banks, but also large universal banks and uh, that uh, that do have private banking and uh, that that range from um, pretty much from from retail to ultra high net worth individuals and um, with us. The, um, they are. They can use our system uh, to start with customers in the retail area and follow up through uh, mass affluent, affluent, and then also move into private banking to really have a very high touch personal experience with their customers, but also optimized on the other side through call centers uh, where they cre really can have mass um, uh, um, answering of uh, in inquiries and, and questions and doing um, telesales uh, through the screen sharing and, and co-browsing capabilities and, and video and voice. And do you um, operate in the wealth management sector internationally? Um, you know, is it more of a localized Swiss proposition for you or when you're entering the US and the UK and Asia and other places, are you um, also fo focused on the wealth space? Yes, yes, very much. Um, I would say it's really uh, the, the sweet spot uh, of our product is around the advisory and, and that is uh, strongest in, uh, the, in, in wealth management and also in the advisory and high touch advisory part. Uh, so yes, this is, this is one of the strong focuses. And what we are doing right now is really optimizing together with uh, wealth management uh, companies, the different processes in how you advise customers. An interesting aspect to this is, um, so when a wealth manager discovers you, starts to talk to you and learn about what you can do for them, what, what are their pressing needs? What kind of situation do you find them in mostly? I mean, what are they looking for or what problems are they trying to solve? So typically the core problem is that um, they are losing the contact with their customers. Um, I mean, it hit them strongly now during the epidemic situation, obviously, where everybody was uh, in a uh, in home office and really had to try to continue their conversation with the, their customers. Um, and therefore, um, it's, it's, it's really, um, uh, been throughout this situation, something that uh, was was very important to be able to get back into contact with the customers. But there are also some small parts, like for example, if you have in wealth management, um, your customer calling you and uh, asking for a transaction, maybe you want to send uh, some money somewhere. And um, uh, after that, uh, typically, if you if you send if you shoot an email or you send just a, a regular text message, typically the uh, relationship manager would have to call you back to make sure it's you and, and they really get the confirmation uh, that they can do the transaction. With us, um, you have secure messaging, and one message is enough for the relationship manager to execute tra that transaction. So you can really um, uh, reduce the whole callback that is really not uh, facilitating your relationship with uh, the customer but it's, it's it's quite annoying right if you if you just to get the approval have to call back and that customer maybe is in a situation where he doesn't want to get called and uh, so with us you can have one uh, message or maybe a message that is then being picked up by a bot for a transaction and and you can really do it in trading and, and stuff so that's that's some of the needs that we're addressing one thing um, 
we talk about in, in the wealth space, there's a lot of conversation about legacy technology infrastructure, um, challenges in maintaining it, never mind developing it. Um, and you mentioned some of the firms who would be active in the area early, Avalok, Temenos, Creologix, Financics, and so on. Um, are you, um, how tightly, how important is the existing infrastructure of a private banking or wealth management institution for the role that you play as a, let's say, maybe a modern technology provider? Um, you know, is there a clash or does is there a fit? How does it look? Yeah, so so there is a big fit. Uh, we are in general we're independent of the backend systems. Unblue can be uh, put on every digital touch point. So pretty much put as a layer on top of every digital touch point. So it doesn't really matter what system you have in the back. But um, through our integrations, our partnerships that we have with a lot of uh, banking vendors, um, we have um, established a ecosystem together with them where you can use our system as the dialogue and collaboration layer on top of every digital touch point and then can additionally trigger processes and uh, like transactions uh, or update the CRM information in those systems um, because we already have built integrations with uh, those systems. Also in terms of security and compliance, um, we have gone through all the, the tests including penetration testing and um, we are aware and compliant with all the local market uh, regulations like uh, HIPAA, ISO 27001 compliant for, for worldwide processes, FCA in UK, BaFin, FINMA. Um, we are supporting transactions for MIFID 2, PSD2, uh, GDPR, uh, and, and all of that has been built together, obviously, with uh, the different uh, banking system providers. Um, and, and is, is supported uh, with our system. And that wouldn't work if we were completely decoupled, but still we are independent on top of every system. Understood. Um, you, you've provided, I think, a few USPs or some um, sort of your value proposition to the market. Could you maybe put that into sort of one sentence so when you're positioning yourself in front of clients or you're perhaps seeking to differentiate from competitors, how do you describe Unblue and, and the products uh, or the product proposition? Right. So we provide a means for the dialogue and the collaboration between the bank employees and their customers in a secure and compliant manner. And that's unique uh, internationally to the extent that we do it and that we have proof for it. So we've gone through all of the, the different testing uh, um, in, in the financial services space. Um, and if we now look a little bit more at the solution in, in detail, um, what can you tell us about this? You know, we talk a lot about modularity and different indiv individual functionality in the platform. It seems quite broad. What are the, the individual modules or the functions that exist within the Unblue um, proposition? Right. <clears throat> so um, we typically start with the secure messenger as the basis to really exchange information in an asynchronous but also synchronous way uh, if you want to go then into live chat. Uh, so me secure messaging, live chat, and video and, uh, and voice chat, also co-browsing in uh, four different flavors. Uh, we can exchange documents, we can co-browse documents, we can go to the internet with black and white listed access to different international websites, but also embedded co-browsing where we have those two patents where you can share the locked in space of a online banking system. Um, and then several integrations into third party systems that we have existing with bots. Uh, for example, with, with Core AI or Raza or Enterprise Bot, we can do an integration in uh, the back end, but also with uh, social media channels uh, like WeChat, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, and uh, regular SMS uh, services. Okay. And is the platform sort of proprietarily built um, f from the ground up? So I think that's the case. It is uh, fully built on uh, Java with some uh, local components. Technically, I'm not going to go dive into the depth of, of all the technology, uh, but it has been built from bottom up 
with uh, Java and its Kubernetes and OpenShift based for scalability purposes. And yes, it's it's therefore it's uh, it's closed code. Um, uh, mostly we're using open source code uh, for our product, but we're not using typical libraries because we mm -hmm. always have to run together with an existing web application or a mobile application in the same uh, sandbox. Uh, yep. So uh, running together means we, we uh, have to avoid that we collide with that system. So therefore, yes, it's, it's built independently and uh, with a, a high um, uh, a comfort for integration where it's fully compatible with anything that you run on uh, in a web browser or as a mobile application on Android and, and iOS. Understood. And, and when firms engage with you, I mean, do they typically engage in a certain area? So it's in the messaging area or in video or you know, screen share? Um, is there a sort of typical entry point? Does firms start with everything or do they start with a little piece and build from there? Yeah, until two years ago, uh, they have started with a, a kind of a best of breed approach, trying out a certain functionality. Um, we have a lot of customers who have started many years ago with co-browsing, uh, many of them in online support, in online banking. Uh, and then a, a, the, the most successful functionality besides that uh, is then secure messenger and live chat. Mm -hmm. um, but from that basis, um, uh, our proposition as we have built it out to a platform, um, today it's typically uh, moving into a strategic decision when they, where they are saying uh, that they uh, want to consolidate the, uh, the existing uh, different channels, the different medias that they have yeah. built during the past, and they uh, want to go with one platform. Uh, so today it's really the, 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 um, the decision is typically based on the seamless integration of all those different features. So for example, you start with a live chat, you hand over to a relationship manager who then transforms that interaction into a messaging channel where you can also at two o'clock in the night send an answer or ask a question where you can then drag and drop uh, your uh, document in your proposal uh, make sure that it's MIFIC compliant where you can then open it up in co-browsing and sign it and, throw, and pull it back into the process everything stored compliant um, for the bank in that messaging thread and then move forth and back between those different functionalities and and that's the, the real value of our platform and uh, obviously if you have an existing chatbot in place what you can do is you can just stick it into unblue and use it together with unblue in uh, 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 and use it together with the um, uh, with our user interface uh, to show it to the customer and hand over between an agent and the bot or between a bot and the bot or uh, from a bot to an agent and so on. Understood. Um, presumably that would be the case with things like WeChat and WhatsApp. I mean, you don't rebuild those technologies, you integrate them. So if there's a demand from clients, as there probably increasingly is now, then your platform will integrate those offerings into a common environment. Exactly. So we have pre-built integrations in those channels. Um, so it's just a matter of, of setting things up, getting your account, like applying for that account and we support on, on the application for the accounts and so on uh, to, to get you connected to those channels. And then you can also run uh, start a communication on a uh, secure messaging channel and then move over uh, to a, a, a public channel or vice versa maybe pick up a customer yep. on WhatsApp, and when it, when the information is getting delicate, uh, that you pull them in on a secure messaging uh, channel. Um, uh, we're always compliant also with WhatsApp and WeChat, uh, so all the, the, the information is stored. It can, all, and it can also not be deleted when it's, uh, once it's sent into the messaging channel, even though you have a functionality in WhatsApp, for example, where you can delete content, our compliance feature in the back yep. is storing the information and is, is keeping it for uh, compliance purposes. Yeah, so it's um, accessible for a, a longer period of time. Um, as you've um, 
moved from, say, a suite of products to a platform and, and coordinating all of these propositions or these capabilities, when you look forward, are there certain trends that are coming in this area that you will be integrating in the near future or reacting to? I mean, WhatsApp and WeChat is maybe relatively new in the private banking space. Is, is there anything else that's coming um, that uh, the market should be aware of? Well, in, in general, is uh, it, the certain movement about uh, AI support. So the advisor, the relationship manager is becoming bionic, right? Uh, they, they are supported uh, by technical processes, by bots uh, who give them suggestions, who maybe give uh, provide a sample answer that you can that you want to then apply to uh, to a conversation uh, you want to hand over to to the bot. So it's 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 mainly on uh, the the uh, what we're seeing in the near future. Uh, it's mainly the optimization uh, of the different processes and it's not just going uh, for optimization but, but also for autonomy of the system so really bringing the system into the game as a as a lead stakeholder who can drive um, uh, processes forward like the self-driving car that will be evolving over the next years um, it, it's really um, a, a, a self-driving uh, a dialogue that is uh, triggered and, and that's part of the direction that we're seeing in general um, in integration everything starts to integrate and everything that can be automated will be automated uh, so um, what we're seeing is that the, the demand that has started with uh, the WhatsApp capabilities and the ease of use and everybody's using WhatsApp or WeChat or, or alike uh, privately um, that's the terms that the customers are applying to um, the relationship with the bank and they are asking uh, for those kinds of relationships. So if we want to know what's coming in, in, in business in the future, what we need to do is what are, look at what are the trends in consumer um, and, that, that, and, and apply those to uh, the, the business. Um, this actually brings me to a question I was going to ask a little while ago, which is this is about collaboration between the advisor and the client and enhancing that and making it easier for both sides. You know, when private banks, wealth managers are looking at this, are they being driven by client trends? Are they being delivered, driven by sort of internal um, requirements around their advisor? Is, is there one way that's leading the other um, or are the two pushing together? It's, it's both. Uh, so um, from the user experience, it's mainly uh, driven from the clients. They are asking for simplicity. Um, and, and this is what we are providing with our user experience, with our user interfaces and with these integration. But obviously, uh, from the bank side, uh, you need to optimize, you need to, to uh, uh, reduce call durations in the call center. And, and that's where you are you're just a lot quicker if you co-browse and, and can see what the customer sees immediately. Um, but also, you want to increase the trade velocity. Um, so uh, it, uh, the more transactions that you can do with a customer, the more profitable is, uh, it is for the bank. Uh, so you need to drive um, from, from the banking out to the customer certain topics, which are then obviously only accepted if they're well received with the customer, if they like to do yeah. this. But, but optimization from the bank and, and the pressure and also, I mean, you've seen it with, with COVID uh, just in, in the beginning now. Uh, a, a very strong need uh, to have uh, the possibility to uh, have an online conversation. This is going to continue. Uh, we're not over with the ep epidemic. Yep. Hopefully, um, we're, we're going back to a new good normal uh, very soon. But in, in general, what what this helped us to see is that it's possible to do it, but you need to have the, the right tools. So if you just take a a uh, system like Zoom or any any general system, even if you go end-to-end -end encryption, uh, you don't you're not compliant. You you don't have the, the proper security uh, in place, and you cannot go into an online banking and share the screen of an online banking with that. It just wouldn't yeah. wouldn't work. Wouldn't technically work. And if it would technically work, it would definitely be something that you must not do uh, because of security and compliance purposes. So so therefore, um, it has started. Um, uh, the whole world has started to understand that the remote collaboration is very important and that it's, it, it's possible. Um, but now you need to have the right tools to really bring that forward and accelerate it. 
Yeah, perfect. So, so um, uh, it was a long answer for, for a short question. Very right, good. We'll, we'll come on to COVID and I suppose trends in a minute and um, you know the here and now for this kind of um, functionality. Uh, one quick question on kind of KPIs. You touched on some of the efficiencies, cutting advisor, uh, uh, cutting call center time, for instance. Are there um, key KPIs that you can point to that these technologies bring to wealth managers once they're integrated into their environments? So, key benefits that they achieve from working with firms like yourselves? Um, yeah, so, so it's, it's on both sides. It's more cost effective and it's also re uh, uh, revenue generating. Um, but the other thing that I also mentioned, it's the high touch human to human interaction supported by machines. Uh, so, for example, you, you don't want to have someone at uh, some staff at the ATM handing you out the money. So online banking, self-service transactions, uh, that's, that's well uh, accepted. But um, as soon as you have a question or you need a confirmation um, or um, you, you need to really make sure that as a customer that what you're doing is the right thing, um, you want to have um, a confirmation from somebody, uh, from, from staff or uh, from an advisor. And then you, um, uh, therefore, what, what you can do with our system is really um, drive revenue. Uh, yep. You can accelerate uh, the trade velocity. You can have, uh, um, you can close deals uh, remotely end to end. Uh, so seamlessly like uh, doing a contracting with with the signature, doing an onboarding with ID verification and so on. All of that uh, can be done to really optimize the processes and also make sure that you can close the deals. So it's, it's cost cutting, but it's also revenue generating. And, and has that um, sh uh, dynamic between the two evolved over time? So the industry, you know, after the financial crisis was a lot of the time focused on cost cutting, less so perhaps on revenue generation. Um, are you seeing the balance shift? I mean, were you normally being bought for cost cutting rather than revenue, gener revenue generation? And maybe now it's the other way around? It's both. Um, cost cutting is also, uh, it's all the time. It, it has been there all the time. What we have seen is what has evolved during the last five years is really the advisory part. Uh, so uh, the, the advisory revenue generating part has really evolved. Um, the cost cutting part, where you where the remote support case uh, was was the most obvious one, um, uh, started 12 years ago when we from the outset. Um, the advisory case was only um, for some early movers at that time uh, because typically banks would only move forward if they see that in the market their competitors are also moving forward in that field. And that has just started to evolve maybe three years, three to five years ago. And um, there is a big run right now, obviously. Yeah, indeed. Markets move forward very quickly. Um, when you look at wealth management and technology and you consider maybe the buying behaviors and the status of the industry, um, how would you describe it? I mean. It's evolving clearly and it's being forced to evolve certainly now. Um, would you in, in, uh, describe it as a um, forward thinking, advanced kind of a sector as, or, you know, a lot of people say it's maybe not backward, but it's a slow mover. Uh, how would you describe wealth management and its um, focus and engagement with technology today? Uh, I would describe it as, a, as typically in general as a slow mover um, with uh, from time to time giant leaps. Um, here again, sorry for, for repeating that again, but um, due to the situation of the lockdown, obviously you had to uh, embrace technology to get in, in contact with your customers. So, and that triggered a leap. And I think there are different um, uh, elements, uh, technology, or maybe uh, from from the market, maybe from, from cost cutting initiatives where you have to downscale um, that you, that, that are triggering uh, to move forward. But I would say it's not a, a space that is a very highly exploring all new innovation. Um, but if you, if you do have innovation and if, if it's clearly uh, a, a, a business purpose that, um, uh, that is recognized, uh, it, it can be very quickly adopted. Um 
when you obviously you, you you know i mean maybe whatsapp is a good example or wechat when you have to bring these into your environment um if the sector isn't a forward thinking or at least it's not a quick mover um where do you look for innovation to then bring into wealth management i mean is it your job to educate the market and therefore you have to go looking for innovation outside of financial services or out, at least outside of wealth management um, partially it is, uh, but we also listen to our customers. We, we listen to where are the needs, where does it hurt, where um, are the issues about addressing, for example, millennials uh, who are um, um, also obviously uh, becoming uh, richer and richer over time and are uh, more uh, used to using uh, the self-service portals and, and technology and uh, Typically, even if, if they're asked uh, to um, interact with someone, they prefer maybe the chat channel over the, the, the phone. Um, so what we're looking is really um, closely at customer requirements, uh, the customer needs, uh, but also at the uh, consumer demands uh, that we're seeing. And that can come obviously from other industries uh, where we're trying to anticipate what is being uh, what, what is moving forward uh, in general and what is being adopted and how can you translate that into the uh, banking space and wealth management space. Um, thinking of COVID, obviously it's been a challenging time for everybody, not uh, just financial services or wealth management. Um, where was, you know, what kind of conversations were you having with potential clients or existing clients once COVID became a reality and the lockdown became a reality and firms couldn't meet their, or the advisors couldn't meet clients in person. Um, what kind of conversations was that driving for you? I mean, was it panic or was it sort of, you know, we, we just got to speed up implementation of various things? Where were they? Where were they? Uh, yeah, so so I think we, we heard uh, most of what you just mentioned. Um, one example was an insurance company, uh, but it could have been a, a, a wealth management company as well, that um, uh, where we got a call um, that they wanted to go live uh, within two weeks uh, because they're, all of their brokers um, got cancellations on their meetings that they have fixed with their customers. Um, so they really were uh, urgently looking to move forward. And we were able to really facilitate that uh, a little more than two weeks uh, because obviously of the contract and, and, and everything that uh, took time technologically. Setting it up is, is, is done overnight, uh, but the, the whole thing around and also uh, rolling out and doing education uh, takes some time. So it, it took us uh, like three weeks um, from the initial uh, call to go live. Uh, but also we saw the acceleration. For example, we had one customer uh, who had uh, a RFP and was in, in the middle of uh, the RFP process and said, stop, on blue, we go with you. Um, let's do an installation and let's let's get forward. Let's get uh, that out into the field. Uh, so so very positive reactions uh, and and a lot of uh, strong movement uh, forward. Um, and thinking of a, a particular technology firm in the UK and reacting to this environment, they created a, a stripped down version of their client portal. Um, is that would that be true of you too? I mean. Is your system sort of fully functioning when you're able to deliver it so quickly, or is it a, a stripped back, lighter touch version? Um, so we have not stripped that, that back the functionality. Um, obviously, if you want to integrate to uh, integrate into a, a um, uh, banking environment. Uh, which we are very often, so on-prem installations. Um, if you want to do that, uh, obviously that takes a little more time, but it's the same product, uh, but we have deployed it from our cloud. So we have a cloud uh, that is running um, thousands of, of customers, um, which are using uh, the system on a daily basis, and that's set up with a new account overnight. Um, and, and so therefore it's the same product. But what we have done is obviously due to the situation that we have built a special package for customers who were in need and, and urgently needed our product um, where we had our, our product for a short duration at a special offer. So yep. it was only mainly on the commercial side because our product is in general lightweight 
but you can fully integrate and then it becomes obviously the, the platform uh, that that is uh, deeply integrated uh, in the bank. So it's, it's it both is possible. If you don't do that full integration, it's running from the cloud um, yep. and, and you can uh, use it overnight. Okay, so in terms of deployment, generally you, you offer a range of opportunities or options for clients so they can have in-house, on-site, um, hybrid cloud, your, your private cloud, um, public cloud, all of those options are available. Yes. Okay. Yes, all of um, those options are available and it's all the same product. Obviously, there are certain aspects. If you, for example, have an integration uh, with your technology stack inside the bank, um, you do have a little more functionality uh, like single sign-on that is inherent in, this, in the system. You wouldn't have to go out and build a single sign-on connector uh, to the cloud for that. Uh, so it's everything in the bank so but in general it's it's the exact same product for all of our customers uh, they are just on a linear version uh, yep. scale that that they move forward uh, but eventually all our customers go through the same versions moving forward of the same product perfect um having sort of been in and around the sector for a while now not just in technology, but technology, I think, is a, is a perfect um, example. One of the inhibitors or the barriers of technological innovation and change in wealth management were the advisors, the private bankers, relationship managers, whether they liked or didn't like to use technology, whether they had an established means of working with their clients. Um, do you find that advisors are ever a barrier to the work that you do with clients, or are they um, easy adopters and, and happy adopters of new technology when you're working with them? Um, I think it's like uh, if, if you st uh, first start to uh, learn how to ride a bike um, and, and people take it differently. Some jump on it and, and fall over a couple of times and get up and, and run the bike uh, very quickly. And some of them are reluctant and um, I say I'm going to walk for a while and I'm going to push the bike on the side and let's first take a course and, and learn how to use it. So, so we're seeing uh, different people and that's actually nice. Obviously, there are some quick early adopters and then there are some that are reluctant. In the long run, uh, we're seeing that everybody is um, uh, maybe sometimes in different ways, uh, but everybody is adopting our product and, and uh, sees obviously the value. Um, it's typically just how much value do you get out in addition to, to what you're doing. And it also depends largely on um, how you work with your customers. If you have a lot of customers um, who, where you have uh, only very little contact once a year uh, going through the portfolio, even there, obviously, uh, it would be helpful to, to be able to do it online. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, if the customer is, is just saying, take my money and I trust you, uh, do with it what, uh, what you think is right, um, then you don't need that much interaction. Maybe then you concentrate on a, on a, a couple of meals a year together, lunchtime. Uh, but if if you obviously want to have higher interaction, what we're seeing is that customer demand is moving into um, a, a closer interaction and wants to understand the market and and wants to know. Um, uh, how they have to move in, in a volatile market and in, in a market like the one that we have now where we have a, a very strong bull period for, for, for a very long time, even now with COVID, a small correction, but it's, it's on the rise strongly again. Um, you, you need to understand how you, how you move. Are you going to put more money into it and, and want to be close to your relationship manager? Yeah, um, you made an interesting point. I think um, in the last five years, the the growth of the advisory side of this toolkit in terms of supporting that process. Obviously, wealth management deals with different segments of clients, from you know, let's say retail through to family office. Um, you know, with high net worth, ultra high net worth, mass affluent, whatever terms you want to use, whatever thresholds you want to use, and it has different propositions: discretionary, advisory, execution, and so on and so forth. Do, do you fit best in a certain kind of area here? I know you've said you work across all of them. Um, talking about COVID and advisory, it's clearly um, a, a sort of Swiss private banking model of, uh, of engaging clients. But do you fit in a do you fit best in a certain area? Um, or would you say your application is quite broad across use cases? 
Um, in general, I would say as long as there is a certain touch of advisory, um, so where it's not just pure messaging, but you really um, uh, want to have the possibility to advise customers. But it, but then it goes from retail to ultra high net worth individuals, uh, because it, with retail maybe it's it's a loan, maybe it's a mortgage. Um, uh, and a mortgage goes through all uh, the different uh, types of customers, um, but but then if you go ultra high net worth, um, you also want to have uh, the possibility to to receive a message uh, and and really um, not disturb the customer. So um, their messaging is is as well there. So uh, the answer is actually no. There is no uh, sweet spot, but in general, obviously the seamless integration of all the different features that we have enables you to really leverage throughout all the different areas um, all the different types of customers uh, to really have the appropriate type of uh, interaction dialogue and collaboration with your customer um, uh, so, so it's really across all the customer segments understood um Sorry, just um, um, in terms of COVID, um, obviously firms have been put in potentially a very difficult situation in terms of how they converse and communicate and engage clients. Um, would you say firms have sped up their sort of focus on technology because of this? I mean, has it, I think you've touched on this before, it provided a shock um, and maybe projects that were two, three, four, five years away, whatever the time span would be, were now immediate um, uh, have you seen that and in, if, in which if so you know what have firms been doing what has their focus point been right so um yes we have seen it definitely um there there was a strong uh, acceleration in that part and what we have been seeing is that obviously most of the companies have looked at at what they already had and tried to put that to use um, uh, sometimes more, sometimes less successful because, uh, as I said before, maybe the, the, the system looked like uh, it, it would work. Uh, a general video conferencing looked like it would work, uh, but it, it really doesn't fulfill uh, the need and, and the purpose of, of, of what you use it. So um, what we're seeing is that um, first, typically, you would look inside and then you would go out and see what's a system that can solve your need. And then we saw two approaches. Uh, some approached uh, us in a manner of, um, we need to have a quick fix. And obviously we wanna know if uh, this is a sustainable uh, way to move forward. Um, and others said, okay, we cannot fix what we have right now. We wanna do it right from the outset. And, and therefore let's first talk and then start to build it up and roll it out with a full integration within the next six months. Um, so, so, so different approaches. Uh, but in general, there, there was from panic uh, to really staying calm and, and uh, just looking at what do we have to do uh, and not waste any money on any short-term fixes uh, yep. to then be able to address um, that need in the future, but there was definitely a very strong push towards digital interaction. Um, and in terms of how you would recommend a client, a wealth manager approaches this topic, so let's say they're very traditional, they phone, email, maybe there's a client portal, maybe not, but they want to move in an environment much more like yours. How would you, how do you typically recommend they start? So do they start in a certain area with a certain kind of um, capability um, or, or do they look more broadly? Um, that's also pretty in individual for, um, for, for the purpose and for the, the, the culture at the, uh, what you have at the bank. Um, in general, what we are suggesting is that you pick out the, the use cases uh, where you uh, see an immediate value and where you have a, a big pain in the beginning. So this might be that you cannot um, go through the portfolio with your customers and then apply yep. maybe a, a setup that is limited just to that use case um, and then do the math and the, the homework um, 
meanwhile to then roll it out throughout the other processes, uh, use case by use case. So typically we suggest that you look at use cases and uh, that you look on how you can apply our solution to that specific use case to solve that need quickly, but make sure that you really integrate the platform to um, leverage the whole value of the platform and have it across all channels. So if you first start, um, for example, independently, maybe from the cloud uh, with a use case where you say uh, you you have some, um, uh, some, some trading proposals that you want to send out to the customer and go through them and get them signed off and, and execute them, uh, that you then can move into the online banking with the portfolio and look through the portfolio with the customer in the next uh, step um, with the same conversation because that's then reflected there and you can continue in that conversation. Understood. Um, when we look at the future of the sector, so we've had this shock, um, things have sped up, firms will be in a better position, I hope, from a technological infrastructure perspective, from, a, um, from the perspective of being able to engage technologically with their clients. You must look at what the future holds and where the industry is going. Um, can you give us a little bit of a perspective on you know, where you think technologically the private banking wealth sector will be in you know, maybe five years time, what these tools will look like and maybe what they'll enable? Um, I think one element of this is the next generation of clients, you know, the wealth transfer issue. Um, I don't know if you can touch on that as well. Yeah, sure. So, so what we're seeing is the customer is getting more digital. Right, the, the adoption of the digital channels, the mobile, uh, obviously, is something that is going to be more important uh, uh, in the future. It's already very important today, obviously, uh, but it's getting more important. Um, uh, typically, the the today's um, customers. Um, very often still use a laptop to have a bigger overview of, of their situation. We're going to see in the future that uh, a, a big portion is not going to leave the mobile phone for their portfolio to view their portfolio and so on. So so this is something that uh, a trend that we're seeing in, in general. What we're seeing is customers are getting more digital and advisors and relationship managers, wealth managers um, are becoming bionic. Uh, so yep. they are um, embracing technology and it's not uh, that it's it's a replacing of them but it's really a step-by-step -step introduction of supporting uh, elements technology wise this could be uh, as, as simple as a address change bot where you say where, where you just delegate uh, the request from the customer to a bot um, and and uh, the bot can interact with the customer for uh, picking up the new address and and doing the change and reflecting it and getting confirmation and so on uh, but but also a trading bot for example uh, where you do a big portion um, by triggering maybe you look maybe at uh, as a uh, wealth manager you look at at uh, your customers and you send out you select the ones where you want to send out a specific proposal you do a lot of this automated suggested by technology you send them out yep. and and the customers can go through a big portion of the process with a bot um, if it to a proposal and and then uh, confirmation on that and then you maybe there is an interaction and you pick that up and uh, so so the yep. advisor is, is going to is, is going to be able to concentrate more on the specific topics and the specific needs of their customers uh, and this is this is what we're seeing so a lot of things are going to get uh, strongly automated um, and uh, I think that's probably the biggest uh, change uh, that, that we're seeing. So going mobile, going digital, um, uh, strong automation, and um, right. So, so those are the biggest trends that I'm seeing. Yeah. Um, when you think about the role of the relationship manager, um, do you think they need to be trained in this kind of evolving world, um, or can they just experience it as they're working? Um, because it's a very different way of working than perhaps many of them would have been used to over the lifespan of their careers. Right. Uh, my suggestion is always to do a certain training or coaching uh, to make sure that, that you can use uh, the, the technology uh, in a better manner. But obviously the technology itself um, has to be as simple as possible. So you don't have to train how to use, uh, how to press the button, how to make something work, but really, 
how do you apply the technology to make uh, the, the biggest use out of it. So, so um, it should be as simple as possible, but uh, you should really, um, and that's, that's the role that we're seeing also with our company, that, that we're really um, explaining on how you can transform from an existing use case today to the um, new use case that is strongly um, uh, supported by our technology and um, from an existing advisor conversation um, that you do in one room or at lunch uh, into a digital room where you do a remote advisory how can you do it most efficiently but also um, how can you make sure that the value is not lost of your personal advisory um, and just sort of finally touching on sort of Unblue's own journey over the next five years, I think we touched on a little bit earlier, but the industry um, will evolve, as you mentioned. Um, what are you going to be doing um, to, to support that um, and to push your firm forward over the next couple of years? Right. So, so we're going to be guiding financial institution into this rapidly changing future. Uh, so we, we're, we're seeing ourselves as the facilitator, uh, helping to transition into this bionic relationship manager. Um, and, and here I don't want to scare anyone off. Uh, it's really something supportive and you can always shut it off if you like, but it's, it's a supporting mechanism. The person still remains a person. Um, um, and since, as I said, everything that can be automated will be automated and everything that can run autonomously will run eventually autonomously, um, we're seeing ourselves as supporting this process and taking uh, also the banks by their hands and moving them into that um, uh, digital space safely and, and um, uh, compliant important and profitable and profitable yeah okay well um luke um thank you very much for speaking to me today um much appreciated thank you for giving me the a good broad introduction to one blue and um what you do who you service some of your thoughts about the industry um so much appreciated um and uh, yeah we will look forward to i hope speaking to you again on an, another session um on a related topic so thank you again thank you looking forward it was a pleasure Great, good. And thank you everyone for listening and we will be speaking to you all again soon. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye.